on your screen, Chris. Going live here now. And good evening, folks, and welcome back to our page, Astronomy by the Bay. Um, my name is Chris Kerwin. I'm coming to you from St. John, New Brunswick. And uh, tonight we're going to have an offering of a few objects uh, in our night sky. We're getting clouded out fairly quickly here in St. John. Uh, the clouds are moving in from west to east uh, very quickly. So uh, what we're going to try to do is offer what we can to you. Uh, in St. John itself, we're clouded out completely right now. Uh, so Mike Powell uh, was sitting by uh, ready to offer something, but uh, we're going to have to move into uh, Hampton area to, to collect an image. So on our uh, call tonight, we have uh, uh, Mike Powell here in St. John. He's a RASC member uh, from our local St. John Astronomy Club. And uh, we have uh, Paul Owen is uh, sitting in Hampton right now tonight, uh, working on his remote observatory. And we have Emile Cormier with us from Batouche tonight. Emile's uh, getting set up uh, in the background there. So Emile's going to be a little bit while uh, coming along online with us. But uh, tonight what we're going to start with is uh, offering uh, a view of the Triangulum Galaxy. Now, first of all, uh, Mike, maybe I can get you to share for a moment, and we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we're doing what we're doing here. So, uh, Mike, do you want to take control? Okay, let so, me get you up here. Yeah, so Mike's going to share uh, his screen. And... Uh, I'm watching comments come in through the screen. Hello, Carolina Sky. Uh, welcome. And Ann McAllister. Hi. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the show tonight. So uh, Mike is showing us a sample view of what we're doing. Uh, so Mike, could you talk a little bit about uh, what you've got set up there? Well, this is the inside of my observatory being filmed in infrared. I've got a ASTG 5 uh, go-to mount with a 70 millimeter William Optic APO. Stacked on top of that is a 66 millimeter uh, APO. Uh, I'm using an Altec Altair camera uh, and I'm unguided as of, uh, or for tonight anyway, but uh, unfortunately when I rolled the roof open, the sky turned white. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's the conditions. Uh, we're expecting a storm here in the next uh, day or so. So clouds moving in pretty quickly from our southwest right now. So uh, in St. John itself, we're clouded out. Um, if we had gone live maybe a couple of hours earlier, we might have been able to catch it. But uh, such is the weather for the maritime provinces in Canada. So uh, we're, we're accepting it and we're moving forward. Uh, there are, will be nights maybe in the future that we can't offer anything through our, our live feeds, but we'll certainly find uh, objects that we can offer through uh, programs like Stellarium and, and other ways to, to get the live feed. So this is Mike set up uh, in St. John. And unfortunately right now Mike can't offer uh, what we were uh, going to choose for a target for Mike uh, for this evening. So we do have Paul in Hampton. That's the, that's the fortunate part about being able to bring people on from other locations is that uh, the skies may be cloudy out for us, but uh, hopefully somewhere else they'll be able to get on live. So let's uh, switch over to Paul then, maybe. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Okay. And I'm going to get uh, Paul. Could you share your desktop, please? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Chris, if you can accept the invitation from my uh, Will do. telescope yep. uh, One second. Skype account. Okay. I'll get you on here. And how do I accept you? You might have to go to your contacts. Okay. One second here. I'll get you added on here. <laughs> Sorry, Mila, I'm a little bit uh, slower with Skype. You can see my live screen. Anybody see my live screen here? And give me a hand to uh, accept Emil's uh, call. I'm sorry, Emil. I'm not quite sure how to accept it here. Okay, forget about it. I'll, I'll do it the same way as uh, Paul and uh, Mike. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry about that. No, no it's okay. Thank you. Um, I want to try to share my screen just for a second, Paul, if I can. And get us back here. <clears throat> yep, 
And what I was trying to do is bring up a Stellarium for view. Okay. <laughs> so uh, just just wanted to show uh, where Paul is looking at it in the night sky right now. Hopefully this is coming up. We'll wait here for a second. Make sure it comes up on uh, the live stream. Hey, Brian. Uh, Brian, welcome. And uh, Robert. Okay, so we're looking at, uh, Paul's going to bring up our view of the Triangulum Galaxy. I just wanted to show uh, whereabouts we were looking in the night sky. So here we are looking in the southeast at about, uh, I guess we're at uh, 8.07, so that's where the time is set up for. So in our southeast sky, you can see that Orion's rising right here um, in, in the uh, east-southeast right now. And uh, if we took the three stars from Orion and pointed straight through, we'd hit up into the Pleiades cluster, which is something we, we're going to offer uh, in a few minutes here. But carry on right straight through, and we hit up into the Great Square of Pegasus, which sits here. I'm using the program called Stellarium right now to offer this view. And Stellarium is a free download. If you want to go to the website stellarium.org, it helps set up your night sky for you. It's very easy to install, very easy to, to offer um, some nice uh, night sky views. I look at it uh, every night before I go out and offer outreach uh, to anyone else. So here's the Great Square of Pegasus. We would continue out two stars and then up two stars to find the Andromeda Galaxy. Well, from the Andromeda Galaxy, we just draw a straight line down through the star, and then we would hit Triangulum, about the same distance away from uh, the Andromeda Galaxy is Triangulum Galaxy. And that's called Messier 33. And uh, that's about 2.7 million light years away. It is visible uh, through binoculars, but very faintly visible. Um, you'd need uh, a telescope about 40 power really to start to reveal a little bit of what you're looking at. It's a face on spiral galaxy and I'm going to let Paul take control now and bring up uh, the object if you would, Paul. Okay. All you have to do is take steps. There um, we go. So, Valerium off. Yeah. And I think I can do that by minimizing that. And are we not looking at your screen right now? So you're going to start sharing? Um, yeah, I'm sharing now. I think there we okay, are. Okay, yep. And uh, <laughs> we can mic back up. So do you, want to, do you want to try sharing again there, Paul? There we go. I think I got you. Okay. Uh, let me see here. Okay. Hey, Mike. <laughs> Hello. Hey, hi, everybody. <laughs> All right. Let me just, just that attractive. Yeah. It always has to come back to me. It's technology, guys. We're going to get used to this eventually. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. So All right. There we go. If, am I up there now? You are up there now. Okay, good. So um, <laughs> what, what you're seeing here... Um, is uh, the Triangulum Galaxy, the one that, of course, that Chris was just talking about and pointing out in the night sky. And, um, and what you're seeing there now is a stack. It's somewhere around about 200 and maybe 10 um, uh, individual 15-second images all stacked together. And it's a relatively bright target uh, when you use a camera. And um, so it's, um, it's certainly uh, it's something you can see with a telescope, uh, actually, Emil and I were trying to have a peek at it through a scope up in um, Monday during one of the star parties, and uh, it was my first time looking for it, and uh, it's really quite something to see there. But, of course, it's, it's nothing compares to it when you see it when it's photographed. Um, so that's basically what you're looking at there. Now, um, I started to get a little bit clouded out uh, here, and so it started to get a little bit murky looking. But you can still see all the uh, the arms in the in that uh, easily. You can see the formation of the galaxy, and I actually have an, a photograph um, that I'm going to put up of the triangulum that I actually took uh, through the same equipment that you're looking through right now, actually. But because we're live stacking, you're not going to get the same um, length of exposure that I did on this photograph. And these photographs were about three minutes long. And there was about, I think on this one, about 85 of them that was all stacked together. And so this is, this, this is what you can see live, which is very impressive. And then this is what you can actually see when you, uh, when you take a photograph of that image. 
um, over a period of time. So wow, amazing. It, it it cleans it up a lot. Um, you can really you know you can get that nice blackness in the space, which is what we look for, and then you can start to see uh, a lot more of the colors uh, more vividly. But it's uh, it's an absolutely stunning. Uh, galaxy to look at. It's beautiful. And, um, yeah, and that's the photograph right there. So a little bit about the Spiral Galaxy M33. That's what we're looking at. It's called Messier 33. Um, so these uh, objects were named after a man by the name of Charles Messier, uh, who lived back in 1710. And what he did was he was a comet hunter, and he used to go out in the night sky and try to find targets uh, that were um, that were comets. But uh, once he found out that they didn't move across the sky, then he realized that uh, they were not comets. So he called these uh, items comet, uh, not a comet number one, not a comet number two, basically. And uh, he got up to 33 and found this one. Uh, so this is called the Triangulum Galaxy. And uh, it's earned its uh, nickname basically because it sits close to the constellation of Triangulum in the sky. It's about uh, half the size of our Milky Way. And it's M33, or Messier 33, is the third largest member of our local group of galaxies, which is uh, compromised or uh, composed of about uh, 50 galaxies or 55 galaxies that comprise our local group of galaxies, uh, of which the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way are both part of. Um, observations reveal that the Triangulum Galaxy star formation rate is actually about 10 times higher uh, than the average found in the Andromeda Galaxy, previously her, uh, surveyed by Hubble. Uh, so Hubble's taken many uh, photos of, or, or images of this area of the sky. And you can see these uh, blue areas that uh, maybe you can point to there, Paul. That's, those are areas of, of extreme star formation that's happening right now. And part of the reason is that when uh, a galaxy like this, a spiral galaxy, uh, tends to rotate, um, you, can, you can picture the fact that all these stars are rotating around the galaxy at different rates. So as they rotate at different rates, um, some of them uh, tend to compress against other stars, and that causes an, in an increased uh, uh, an amount of uh, star formation. All right, and I've got a little tidbit um, from our, our gal who gives us all the interesting little facts and uh, funny features about some of these uh, targets we're talking about. And that's uh, Rosanna Armstrong. Thank you for the uh, contribution, Rosanna. Yes, thank you, Rosanna. And so here's the one about M33. So in March of 2012, online The Onion, the Onion which is a satirical news website, reported that a fleet of warships from the planet Zarklan 12 in the Triangular <laughs> Galaxy has arrived at Earth to intervene in the Syrian war on the side of the Syrian Rebel Alliance. Wow, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a story to talk about. There's a, there's a story for the campfire, for sure. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it too, yeah, Mike. <laughs> Thanks, wow. Rosanna, for that great tidbit of information. <laughs> Interesting stuff. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, M33 is is actually suspected to be a gravitational companion of, of Andromeda, and it seems like the both of them are spiraling towards um, our our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. And uh, Andromeda or uh, Mel the uh, M33 galaxy is about three million light years away from Earth. So it's uh, it's probably the farthest object you can see with uh, with the unaided eye from a dark sky site. So you can't see this uh, because of the fact that Andromeda is, or this uh, M33 is facing us. Um, its uh, reflectance, I'll call it, is a lot lower than Andromeda, uh, simply because it's face on to us. So so the amount of stars that are revealed to us, or the amount of brightness that is revealed to us, is a lot lower. So it's very difficult to pick out from a dark sky, but Apparently, there are some that have seen this from a dark sky site uh, with naked eye. And uh, again, both of these galaxies, Andromeda and uh, Messier 33, are both uh, heading towards us. And uh, we know that Andromeda is supposed to collide with us in about four and a half billion years, so uh, we may end up with a triangulum galaxy in our direction as well at the same time. 
has a relatively bright apparent uh, magnitude of about 5.7, making it uh, one of the most distant objects that keen-eyed observers can view with the unaided eye, for sure. But you'd have to be under exceptionally dear, uh, Clark, uh, dark skies to, to view it. I'm ready to start stacking uh, the Pleiades. Perfect, okay. Do you want to start uh, start your stack up? and We'll be coming to you very shortly. Thanks, Emil. Uh, you want me to share my desktop? Uh, well, well, we'll continue with uh, with Paul here for a little bit. If you, if you want to start stacking, that'd be great. Well, I kind of like to show the how the process works. Okay, sure. Go ahead. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, we're we'll just showing Hubble pictures. Sure. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead. You yeah. can share your desktop now. <laughs> nice smile, Mike. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> okay, that should be shared now. Okay, not seeing yet. A snapshot here, Mike and I. <laughs> That's a nice shot, too. Yeah, That's a nice shot. Yeah. Maybe I can stop sharing. Okay. Um, sure, if that'll help or not. Uh, no, it says it wants me to start. So I think I'm already there, so I'm just going to do this. Maybe I'll do that. And. Yeah, no, it's, it's asking me to start, so I think I'm, I think I'm off. Emil, are you sharing now at the moment? I, I activate. Uh, yes, I am sharing. Sorry for the technical difficulties here, folks. Hang on a sec. I see, uh, I see it in the Skype window, but I don't see it on our YouTube. You see it in the Skype window? Okay. Maybe you have to select um, me in the conversation, Chris. I'm trying to select you. Oh. It actually uh, says it's Emil Cormier uh, as a selection, but we're not uh, getting your live feed. Okay, let me try again. And hello, Irene from Campbellton, New Brunswick. Thanks for joining us. Are you getting that now? No, we're still stuck with the same image. Okay, maybe if I moved it to a different window. So yeah, I'm seeing it. But, You're um, seeing it, are you, Paul? Yeah, but just in a small window. I just yeah, have a Skype window. Yeah, I don't have that even in the Skype window. I just have you frozen here. There, I stopped sharing, so we'll see if that comes on. I stopped sharing so I can share on a different screen instead. Okay, I'm going to try okay. sharing my desktop at a second for a second. <clears throat> I can't do that. I'm kind of locked up here in Skype. So, hey, Robert. Uh, Robert says hello. Uh, hey, on there, Neil. Thank you very much, Daniel, for that uh, uh, comment for, about the image. I appreciate it. Hi, Irene from Campbellton. And, uh, hey, PFO Observatory is on. <laughs> How you doing, Mike? <laughs> Not bad. Just explaining what it stands for. Paul, would you mind Would you mind sharing your desktop again, please, Paul? We'll, uh, sure. we'll see if there's a technical issue here with Skype. Yeah, stack here. And we're stuck uh, on this. Uh, we're stuck on the Skype issue, uh, the Skype image at the moment. <clears throat> I 
course. So sure I'm like, it, it seems to be frozen. Skype is frozen at the moment. And I dare not close it. Let's get a picture up here. Somebody uh, snapped a photo or... Uh... Hang on, hang on, Paul, just a sec. I, I can see you in the window. Okay. I don't know why it won't let me open it. Meal, just do it in a second here, if you don't mind. It's not letting me... Uh, okay, let me try closing that. There we go. Here we're back to life. Okay, hang on. There was a photo that was snapped, apparently. So um, let's go back, Paul, to your uh, to your view for a second. You want to sh share your screen for a second? Um, I've lost connection. Okay, Emil, or maybe you can share yours, uh, your desktop again, Emil. For yeah. There we go. Emil's, you're trying, are you? I'm going to try again. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, I'm sharing my got it, got it now. now. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'll start off here with life. Okay. Okay. There we go. That's better. So everybody see that now? Now we're cooking. Okay, we're back. We're, we're back live, folks. Just a, somebody might have. Uh, it may have been me. Uh, probably was me. Uh, did a screen capture of uh, what we were reviewing. And uh, now we're back to live stacking again. So this time we're offering the uh, the Pleiades Star Cluster M45. And I'm trying to. What I'm doing is uh, taking 15 second exposures, and uh, the software is averaging it out. Um, so essentially, I'm going to be taking like a minute's long exposure without overexposing everything. With okay. each frame that it stacks, it um, reduces the noise and allows me to show the uh, pull out the details in the faint areas. Could you explain a little bit about your equipment, uh, Emil, for us, please? Yes, I have a um, 80 millimeter refractor um, mounted on a permanent pier in an observatory with a um, cooled, uh, dedicated astrophotography camera um, that has a sensor size similar to a DSLR. Nice. So right now, we're, like, again, we're, we're dealing with some cloudy sky issues here in St. John. Uh, Paul is getting clouded at the Fairmount in Hampton, which is outside of our city right now. Emil's in Baktouche, which is just uh, north of Moncton. So he's got a little bit better sky at the moment. Um, so that's one of the advantages now that we're going to start to see some nebulosity starting to appear around uh, some of these, star, or some of these uh, stars that we see here in the screen. Emil, did you want to talk a little bit about 45 or... Yep, keep going, Chris. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Messier 45 is also known as the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. So, a lot of people mistake this one for... That, that nice view there now. It's live stacking nicely. Um, the uh, the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters, is sometimes confused with the Little Dipper. And the Little Dipper is, of course, over in our northern part of the sky. So, the easiest way to find, um, find this Pleiades cluster is to... Uh, Neil, is, is it possible to you, for you to release it back to me for a moment? Yeah, stand by. Okay. I have to stop sure. sharing. Sure, yeah. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to try to start to share. And I'm going to bring up uh, Stellarium here. And the good thing about Stellarium is that uh, not only can I, well, I can find it here on the target voice, but um, we can actually just go to the search button here. And we can type uh, M45, which is Messier 45. Again, it's a Messier object. Charles Messier uh, went looking for these objects that were that he thought were uh, comets. And uh, he found out that we, we found out later on with better telescopes that they were galaxies, star clusters, nebula, that type of thing. So here's the object that uh, that Emil is offering right now. It's called the M45, the Pleiades Star Cluster. It's about uh, 
It's a rich cluster of more than 100 stars. Um, some say there's up to 1,000 stars in that cluster. It's about 40, 444 light years away. And it's in the constellation of Taurus, the bull. So let's go back out here just for a second. And uh, we're going to load up a little bit of the graphics here. So here's the graphics that show you the, the bull. And here's where it sits. So if we take the graphics back off again, we're really looking into the uh, east-southeast sky, right, I guess, right, right about now, at, at the time that we're at right now. And here's Orion rising. So we know Orion, Orion with the, uh, the three stars that make up the belt. Take the three stars that make up the belt, point straight up, and we should end up at the Pleiades cluster right there. Okay, Emil, I guess you can go back to, to sharing again. Thank you. Stand by. Sharing. Great, thank you. Um, just need to see you uh, sharing your screen. There we go. Okay, we're back to sharing. And we're about halfway through our show already. It's going to go back. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. <What's your> <laughs> goes by fast. So that's also um, um, a different type of nebulosity that you're seeing there. Uh, it's called a reflection nebula, and some uh, of the nebulas we see that are more red would be called emission nebulas. And this one um, is called reflection nebula simply because it's the stars up behind that are igniting that, um, the gas, so that you can actually see that. And you see the, so the reflection nebulas or uh, bluish color. So, uh, yeah, so that's one of the pretty things about that cluster. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Did you want me to get it pointed at something else, Chris? Well, we'll hold on here for, for a minute or two. Um, we're probably going to go to maybe if we could go to M15. I don't know if you can get that as a target tonight, uh, Emil. Is your sky still uh, fairly clear where you are? Uh, I don't know if it's below the wall. Uh, okay. Is there, is there a uh, specific target that you'd like to shoot for? We're kind of on the fly here tonight, folks, because of the fact that we're cloudy skies. We did have a few uh, targets selected, but because uh, the clouds moved in quicker than we had anticipated, uh, we're going to be on the fly here for a little bit. Let me talk a little bit about the Pleiades cluster. It's a it's an apparent magnitude of about 1.6, so it's easily visible with the naked eye. Um, if, again, if you look in the east-southeast sky, you'll see something that looks like a little tiny dipper. Um, it's not the Little Dipper. Uh, it can be mistaken for Little Dipper from a lot of people that visit me at the telescope, for sure, at least. But it's certainly visible through binoculars easily, and it's a great target, actually, through binoculars and even small telescopes. Um, the Pleiades cluster has an apparent magnitude of about 1.6, lies an average of about uh, 444 light years from Earth. <clears throat> Um, Messier 45 contains a number of hot blue, extremely luminous B-type stars that we see here, and it's one of the nearest star clusters to Earth. It's the easiest object of its kind to see without binoculars, and uh, M45 has a core radius of about 8 light years, and its tidal radius extends out to about 43 light years. The cluster is home to more than 1,000 confirmed members, but only about a handful of those are actually visible to the naked eye. So most people, when they view this, they see it as the seven sisters because they can see about seven of the stars in the cluster. I've, I've known other people that have actually seen up to 14 stars in this, uh, this little cluster of stars. It's like a stellar nursery. Here stars are being born, actually. Stars, stars are forming from these large clouds of, of nebulosity that you see there. Uh M15 is below the walls for okay. me, so uh, did you have something else in mind? Um, well, I guess we could bring up Stellarium. What would you suggest as a target? I've got the right scope and camera combination for M31. Okay, sure. We can go with our M31. We, we'd we offered M31 on our first week, but it's always nice to take another look at it. If you have something else in mind. Uh, M81, M81 and M82, are they available for you? No, they're too low. Down along okay. the north. Uh, how about the double cluster? Yep. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> so the best time of year to observe uh, M45 from the northern latitudes is actually during the winter months when Taurus constellation rises high in the sky. So we're getting uh, the stars come up about four minutes earlier each night. So each night 
these objects appear higher and higher in our, in our night sky. So M45 is also a nice target all through the winter. Uh, e again, easily visible through uh, binoculars and even small telescopes. It's, it's actually better through uh, small telescopes than it is through uh, telescopes with a higher focal length because you can get the whole object in, in, uh, in the field of view at one time. Any comments there for Pleiades, Paul? Anything else? I do, actually. Okay. <clears throat> and here's another little tip of information from our friend Rosanna. And so here's one. Um, so do you drive a Subaru? The M45 Pleiades um, is the inspiration for the car company. Subaru is the Japanese name for the Pleiades star cluster, which in turn inspires the Subaru logo and alludes to the five companies that emerged to create FHI. Now, the word Subaru means United Japanese, and Fuji Heavy Industries, which is the uh, FHI, has used the term uh, to describe how the Pleiades constellation is a unification of the stars and a unification of companies. Since the seventh st star, seventh sister, is traditionally considered to be invisible, there's only six stars in the Subaru logo. There. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Thanks again, Rosanna, for those notes. That's great. And um, I'm just uh, looking through comments here. The, uh, the stars in the Pleiades cluster might have uh, formed in the last 100 million years, and they will stay gravitationally bound to each other for another 250 million years or so before the cluster disperses as a result of tidal interactions with other objects in the neighborhood. By that point, the cluster will have moved from Taurus over into Orion. And there's a whole history here about uh, uh, the Pleiades star cluster. I'm not going to get into that right now as we start to offer the double cluster here, uh, which Emil has up in our, in our field of view at the moment. Somebody else want to follow through comments there? I'm not sure if I'm catching them all as we go. Mike or, or Paul? Oh, we're pretty much caught up. Okay. Nice view of the double cluster there, Emil. Beautiful. You've got some nice nice skies at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. So the double... Robert, you were asking if uh, SharpCap can be used with DSLR cameras. There's some ASCOM software that's been developed out there that uh, guys are starting to use SharpCap with Canon cameras, yes. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Emil, do you mind if I share my desktop again and I'll bring up uh, the double cluster and show them where, uh, where they're looking? Yep. Okay. That's a really nice capture there. Wow, look at the stars. While you do your thing, I can uh, maybe close up on the cowboy asterism. Yeah, that'd be great. Sure. When, you sw when we switch back, we'll be able to see it. Okay, Zoom great. In. Perfect. Okay, stop sharing. Okay, so I'll share my desktop here for a second. And I've got Mike up again. Hey, Mike. I'm Mike from hey. Canmore. <clears throat> so we're looking at uh, what's called the double cluster stars, and I'm going to go. I'm back in Solarium again. So let's uh, let's go to the search button, and we'll type just double cluster. Again, this program is easily offered through. Uh, you can you can download it easily off of. Uh, the Stellarium's website, uh, Stellarium.org, like Planetarium, only Stellarium. And we're going to bring up the double cluster. Here we are. We're looking into the area of Cassiopeia. <clears throat> Let's bring on the artwork here for a second. And there's the Queen Cassiopeia sitting on her throne. There's King Cepheus beside her and Queen Andromeda on the other side. Her, her daughter Andromeda, sorry. And uh, we're looking right here. So let's zoom out just a bit so we can get an idea of where we are. We're in the northeast sky, and you can see this familiar W-shaped constellation right here that pops up in our northeastern sky, um, well, all year long. Actually, this is a circumpolar constellation, so that means that it never sets. It's, it's in our evening sky uh, all year long. So we can see a familiar W shape here, and depending on what time of evening you're looking at, it might be an M shape. But uh, we're looking into this area right here called the double cluster. 
And you can see how when I select double cluster, it centers it basically on my field of view. So all I'm going to do is I'm just scrolling in with my mouse here to a little bit better view of where we are. And there it is. That's the best view that we can get through Stellarium. And uh, again, we're looking just if we zoom back out a bit. What I like to do is, is to try to make, uh, and we do this a lot as astronomers, as amateur astronomers, we to try to find things in the night sky, we usually try to find a way to get there. So, for instance, with Andromeda here, and the Pegasus uh, constellation, here, we take the great square Pegasus, that's high in our uh, eastern sky right now, we would count out two stars, and we count up two stars, and there's the Andromeda galaxy, for instance. Another way to find the Andromeda Galaxy is to take the W shape here of Cassiopeia and we take this arrow, make this an arrow and point it point straight down to Andromeda. So when we're looking at the night sky, a lot of times we'll take triangles and, and squares and rectangles or whatever and try to find the object. So what I do is I usually make a triangle, a long triangle between these two stars and, Androm and uh, Cassiopeia and then drop straight down. And that gets me to the double cluster. But actually, double cluster is quite visible just with the naked eye. Uh, and you don't have to be really in a dark sky site to find it. it. It stands out pretty prevalent in our in our night sky. Again, we're looking about northeast right there. So, so let's zoom back out again. And Emil, I'll get you to take control again. If you would. I don't know if I have to release control D for you to have it. I just shared it. Okay, you shared. So let's go back and see if we can find you. Again, we're getting into that. Uh, there we go. We're back again. And we're looking at the cowboy. So, Emil, would you like to point out the cowboy to people uh, watching here that they can understand what that is? This was something that was pointed out to me just a few years ago down at Funding National Park at one of our uh, stargazing parties. And about five times a year, we gather together as as uh, members of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, the New Brunswick chapter, which is what we're all members of. Uh, we gather together about five times a year throughout the province of New Brunswick, and we go to visit uh, different uh, national parks and provincial parks to organize what we call star parties. And what that is, is it's an event that uh, we gather together as, uh, as a group uh, for a weekend. And we uh, set the weekends out usually early in uh, early in the year. So early 2020, we'll decide uh, what our dates are going to be and, and where they're going to be. And uh, at one of these uh, specific uh, star parties, this this uh, object was pointed out to me, um, and it was said, "Can you see the cowboy in the double cluster?" And I couldn't see anything. <laughs> so Emil, are you able to uh, to point that out to us? I guess I can. I don't have control of the mouse, so. Can you see my cursor? I'm um, looking for it. I'm assuming uh, the audience can see the cursor. Okay. So, uh, the way that it was explained to me is... Uh, oh. There. Yeah, you look for this uh, bright star... And it would be like the uh, cowboy's head or his eye. It would be like a cyclops. And this arc of stars would be his um, his uh, cowboy hat. And then on each side, there are two outstretched arms, as if he's reaching for his uh, pistols. And the torso and body uh, below it here. So he's, he's kind of rotated... Uh, around 60 degrees. He's not standing up right now in this current field of view. So let's, let's go over that again because it looks like they're seeing my cursor on the on the YouTube uh, site. So here's his hat, basically, his Stetson. Uh, these, three, these three stars here that make up his, his hat. There's his, uh, there's his head. And here's his two arms. And here's his torso. So he's he's outstretched, uh, ready to draw. So we call that the cowboy that sits in, this, in, uh, in one of the clusters of the double cluster. Thanks, Emil. <laughs> That's good. It's a little blurry because I have a telescope better suited to wide views and not close-ups like this. Yep. Yeah. So can we zoom back out again and we'll uh, we'll see if we can still see him. And there he is. He's sitting right here, right in the double cluster.
just looking for comments here. I see the cowboy. <laughs> Irene says, there you go. <laughs> Good stuff, Irene. It took me quite a while to find them here, actually. The double cluster is, is also known as Caldwell 14, and that's the common name uh, given to the open clusters NGC 869 and NGC 884. And what they, those uh, names are, are for the new general catalog, um, uh, which uh, they're, they're close together in the constellation of Perseus. So we're looking in the constellation of Perseus right there, uh, both visible with the naked eye. NGC and eight, uh, 869 and 864 lie at a distance of about 7,500 light years away. NGC 869 has a mass of about 3,700 solar masses, and the NGC 884 weighs in at about 2,800 solar masses. So that's masses of the sun, of course. The clusters are relatively young, both about 12.8 million light years old. So that's that's relatively young in astronomical terms. So if we want to look at the uh, the Andromeda galaxy, um, we're looking at galaxies uh, that are about 12 billion years old. So uh, something that's 12.8 uh, million years old is, is fairly young, really. The the, uh, the Pleiades cluster uh, ranges anywhere from between 75 million to 150 million years old. So uh, that's uh, that's a comparison. So they these uh, these star clusters here are very young. There's actually more than 300 blue-white uh, supergiant stars in each of these clusters. And uh, the clusters are also blue-shifted a bit, uh, meaning that they're, they're traveling away from us a bit. And uh, just going through a few more facts here. The double cluster is a circumpolar, uh, so that we can see that continuously through the night sky. So... Um, uh, because it sits in Perseus, Perseus is circumpolar, so they do rotate right around Polaris, the North Star. So these are constellations. When they, when we talk about circumpolar constellations, those are those that do not set. Um, we see them year round, so you can get a great view of of these two clusters year round. And these are actually quite nice through binoculars. Um, they're quite visible uh, through uh, through the naked eye as well through a dark sky sight. Um, if we go to, say, someplace like uh, Mount Carleton, um, they actually stand right out. They just they catch your eyeball, uh, and you turn your head, and, and there they are. Boom, they're just bang right there. So uh, they are visible uh, very easily through binoculars and uh, with your naked eye as well. Anybody else want to have, offer some comments in there, Paul or Emil? Um, I haven't heard anything on the double plus. Uh, I however... Uh, I, I I must say it's one of the nicest uh, objects if you started observing or if you've been observing for a while. Uh, it's great to look at naked eyes. You can dark in the sky. You can certainly see it. They're very, very easy to see. And, um, but through binoculars, it's probably one of the most significant spectacular binoculars uh, things that you can look at. If you look at it through pretty much any kind of telescope, you're going to have to break up the cluster and look at them individually. But... But it's, uh, it's a fantastic thing to look at. And it's one of the first times you ever experienced what they meant by dying scattered or a black in the back. And that's exactly what it looks like. You get a crystal clear night, a nice dark sky. It's just absolutely stunning. Yes. I agree. <clears throat> yep. It's, it's, it's a stunning... A stunning visual thing for sure. Uh, anywhere that you have uh, a dark sky at all, you'll pick these up very, very clearly through binoculars, and uh, they are completely stunning to, to witness for sure. I don't know if you wanted to show an object, but um, I have the stacking paws, and I can move the telescope to somewhere else while you, you keep uh, talking. Sure, that's great, Emil. Yep. Is there something else that we uh, we could offer here tonight? We're only into about uh, eight forty-five, so we've got about fifteen minutes left here. I'm still going through comments as we uh, as we go through uh, the live here. So. Oh, also, Chris. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering if you could mention about uh, people submitting some photographs. Sure. Yeah. So. Um, Anytime that you have any photographs that you'd like to submit on on uh, on your behalf, we'd be happy to see them uh, end up here in the comments section. Um, so we're looking for photographs of the night sky that you may have taken. It uh, it can be planets, it can be um, star fields, uh, the Milky Way shots, um, anything like that. Please uh, go ahead and comment, uh, place them in the comments section down here below the below the uh, the live feed. Paul, was there anything else you want to add to that? 
submit the photos, uh, you can actually send them, send them to my email if you like, and that's Pacific Paul, it's in the ocean, Pacific Paul at NSN.com, and, and, and we like to share them with, with everybody here on the show, uh, because there's a lot of people that, um, that take a lot of photographs, and again, some, they, they don't happen to be public quality photographs, we just want to share your experiences and, and how we can capture them, so we'd love to see anything that anybody would want, that would want to submit. So again, it's uh, Pacific Paul at NSN.com, and uh, we'd be really, really happy to share them on the show. Yeah, and my address is uh, C. Kerwin at mbnet.mb.ca. You can share them there or just bring them to my Facebook page, Astronomy by the Bay, as well. That That's great, Paul. Uh, it would be nice to, to offer a collection of, of photos here that people uh, people have collected over time, for sure. Absolutely. I'm checking to see if uh, F42 would be visible. But sure. Maybe you want to save that for another time? I don't know. Well, 42 is nice if you want to, to, to offer it, sure. So, that's all nice to look at. Mm. I have to check if it's uh, it cleared my observatory wall. Okay. Emil, what program are you, are you uh, using here? I'm using uh, SkyTrack um, or CopDCI in French. Um, okay. It's uh, not to, meant to be as pretty as Stellarium that uh, Chris was showing earlier. It's more uh, utilitarian, just to uh, find things uh, in the sky. And uh, to, especially in my case, to control a telescope. Or, uh, yeah, I 42 is way still way too low right now. Oh, it is okay. I could offer uh, maybe the M37, an open cluster. Sure. Well, 35. No, uh, I think I can barely get it. Uh, is there anything else up in uh, Cassiopeia we could offer? Oh, uh, the ET. Yeah, we did a ET last week. Um, not sure what else might be up there. There's, There's only so many uh, show pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, right? <laughs> uh, how about M31? Can you get? Uh... Oh yeah. Okay. We'll we'll swing around to M31 again. It's always nice to offer an Andromeda again. It is a it's a it's a pr pretty popular target in our night sky right now. So yeah, yeah I think. Uh, yeah, well, Orion's still fairly low. Like, um, we're going to need about another month or so before we get into Orion, I guess. We're going to be into sometime in January before um, yeah. some of the targets. And believe me, you're going to really like Orion as we get into uh, those targets uh, later on in uh, in January. Uh, it's still in our east-southeast sky, not very high in the sky, maybe 10 degrees or so. It's um, but, uh, but as our evenings again as these um, constellations move up in our sky about four minutes earlier each night by the time we get into uh, sometime in, in late January we'll have Orion nice and high in our southern sky so that'll be a really nice target uh, we have the Orion Nebula in there we have the Flame Nebula we have the Horsehead uh, of course Betelgeuse and um, the stars like that that are uh, that are red supergiant stars that uh, could go supernova at any time really so um, We've got lots of targets in that area to offer as well. I mean, we have to understand that we're going to be running this show hopefully right till sometime in March, um, in April, when people start getting out to uh, to our telescopes again um, for our reach offerings uh, in, in public. Um, so this is to hopefully carry you through uh, for the winter and for us too, because it's great for us because uh, we get an opportunity to offer this uh, from our houses, uh, from from the comfort of our own homes. So. We'll, uh, we'll be with you right through until then. Um, of course, if you have uh, objects as well that you'd like to suggest that we uh, we try to capture, um, we're always willing to, to take a look at, at what at what we can capture for you uh, for for next week's feed, for instance. Or for so what we're trying to do now is is lay out uh, two or three weeks in advance so that we have an idea of what targets we're going to be able to offer. Because of course we have to do some research on the targets and and. Uh, and uh, research the information that, that we can offer to you. So, But if you have ideas or comments uh, that you'd like to, to offer for us, uh, please make sure that you comment underneath the live feed. Uh, even at, at the end of the uh, the broadcast, sometime later on, uh, we're more than happy to, to review back through the comments and uh, and see what you think of the videos as well. If the live feeds are something that, that, uh, that you're enjoying, 
please uh, please let us know in the comment section. If there's something that you think that we could uh, improve on, please let us know in the comment section as well. Um, also, uh, any uh, any time that you can uh, subscribe, if you haven't subscribed yet to uh, the YouTube channel, please do so. Um, future videos will be offered to those uh, who have subscribed. You'll get a, a complete notification right away that uh, that we're online. And uh, please just uh, consider liking the video if it's something that you've enjoyed uh, throughout the, the presentation tonight. So I'm going right. through comments here. Uh, Michael Stewart says, what if you did a late night recording of a location in the sky that you would not see until after midnight? Then offer it as a replacement when the weather is not great. That is something we are considering, Michael, for sure. Um, I'm trying to keep the, we're all trying to keep the program live as much as possible because we want to be able to see your comments come in and we're really encouraging questions. The idea to set this up in the first place was really to offer a live view of the night sky as much as possible. So um, we, we have looked at the fact of uh, maybe recording an episode and placing it up on YouTube and looking for comments later. But the idea here was really a Sunday night astronomy show to be able to offer something live. Now, we know we're going to get into clouded skies. Um, sorry, we live in the Maritimes uh, of, of New Brunswick, Canada, uh, so we know that uh, the skies will not always be clear for us. So there may be op opportunities in the future that we offer just uh, a stellaria view, but at least an image of some type. But the idea here is, is to go live and to be able to get your questions coming in. For those of you who may not know the sky very well, this is basically a teaching astronomy show. So that's the way we're trying to approach this. And we may talk a little bit longer on a topic than, than maybe we should, but we're trying to keep it as, as live as possible to answer your questions as much as possible throughout the show. Uh, guys, anything to add, add, add to that? Or? Um, yeah, also, also if, if, uh, if folks are interested in uh, you know, the, the photography side of things, uh, you know, how we do this and the software that we use and that kind of stuff, you know, we could do a little segment on that as well. Because it's not really a, uh, a really difficult thing to do once you kind of get set up a little bit and familiar with the software. And it's something that uh, more and more um, astronomy enthusiasts are, are getting into with this live, uh, live stacking and live views. Because it's something that you can go out into pretty much any area now and uh, take your computer and cameras with you. And uh, if you've got some friends that you want to show the next guy to, and uh, be a little bit more pest than uh, just look with your nights on a festival. It is great to say it just gives you more of an opportunity to see your season of colors and a little bit more detail on a lot of these uh, objects that you look at. So, so that's something that uh, down there with the viewers might have that. Uh, it's part of the same concern now for that too. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. And uh, now we have a live view of M31, which is the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, thanks, Emil. That looks great. Yeah, this uh, thing out of the way. I understand there, Scarlett. Uh, the person speaking now has a lot of echo, so it's difficult to hear what they're saying. So, Paul, we might have to work a little bit on your mic, I guess. Is it for everyone other than you who has that problem? Yeah, I'm, I'm picking you up uh, easily, um, Emil, no problem. I think it's just Paul. Okay. It's better to uh, use headphones and not speakers to avoid the echo. Okay. This is a learning curve for all of us folks, so this is just our second really live uh, live feed, so please be be patient with us. We're, we're, we're promising to improve the show as we, as we move forward. <laughs> and Emil has uh, M31 right now, Messier 31, the Andromeda Galaxy, which is the next galaxy closest to us. It is the farthest thing you can actually see with the naked eye. And uh, actually, the Triangle Galaxy might be farther. Uh, let me see if I can bring up some notes here. Um, let's see, 31. This is, wasn't this wasn't the target we were uh, expecting to offer tonight. Again, we get clouded out in St. John, so our targets from St. John uh, weren't weren't, for, uh, weren't offered. So when we're looking at this galaxy, we can see uh, M31 is the main galaxy in the center there. We can see M110 and M32 off to the sides there. Those are satellite galaxies of, of Messier 31. Again, it's a spiral galaxy that's about two and a half million light years from Earth. It's the nearest major galaxy to our Milky Way. Uh, when we talk about our Milky Way, there are estimates between 200 billion and 400 billion stars 
in the Milky Way, uh, this galaxy would have about one trillion stars. So about three times the size of our, our Milky Way. And it's actually moving towards us and will collide with uh, the Milky Way within about uh, four and a half billion years or so. And eventually we'll end up uh, as what we call an elliptical galaxy, which we'll show at a, at a later date what that means. Um, it has a very, uh, very large central core here. It's, it, I mean, of course, uh, a trillion stars is something that's estimated. We, we've taken a piece of the Andromeda galaxy and uh, extrapolated um, the amount of stars that would be in that piece and over, over the, uh, the total size of the galaxy. About twice the size of the, of the Milky Way or larger. Uh, with an apparent magnitude of 3.4, the Andromeda galaxy is among the brightest of the Messier objects, so it is visible to naked eye from Earth. When you uh, when you look at the great uh, square of Pegasus, again, count out two stars to the left and then two stars up, and you'll find the Andromeda galaxy right there to the right. So it is easy to pick out uh, through binoculars and, uh, and small telescopes for sure. The Andromeda galaxy was uh, thought to have formed about uh, 10 billion years ago from the collision and subsequent merger of uh, smaller proto-galaxies. So other galaxies have collided with Andromeda over time and they've enlarged the size of Andromeda. So these, uh, these large patches that we see uh, I got the wrong mouse going here. <laughs> I have two laptops open here, and one's uh, looking at YouTube uh, live feeds, and uh, the other one is looking at uh, the Andromeda image that uh, Emil is uh, supplying here. So these large uh, dust lanes here. Paul, can you talk a little bit about that? or <coughs> You've captured this a number of times. Yeah, I can, yeah. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm not not Seems to be okay there now, yeah. Okay, good. We've only got about a minute now for the broadcast, so... All right, good. Well, I, I just wanted to just mention a little bit about um, just some experiences that uh, we're out uh, in the night sky, whether it be at home looking at the back or even doing all the star parties. Uh, and M31 is probably one of the most spectacular things that, uh, that you'll see in, in terms of uh, photography. But with a small telescope, it's, it's actually beautiful to look at. Uh, because, of course, you have the main galaxy and then the two flanking ones. So there's a lot to look at with that one. But it, it just reminds me of a time uh, I was at the uh, Funny Enough Park, one of the parties, and uh, it was the first time I actually saw that. And uh, it was a uh, nice memory. That's another thing I guess about this hobby. A lot of these targets are uh, these memories, and, uh, and every time you talk about one, you got well, oh, here's Korak, but yeah. Anyway, that's kind of what I mentioned about that. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, no. Um, the first time you see Andromeda through the telescope, it appears like a small blob, uh, for sure. But when you start to, to think about the fact that you're looking two and a half million light years away, and those photons of light had to travel for two and a half million years to get to your eyeball. So you're really seeing it as it was two and a half million years ago. This is, this is a huge galaxy, very nice through a wide field eyepiece in a telescope or even through binoculars. Um, but it's always a very pleasing experience for the first time that you view Andromeda for sure. So folks, we're getting up to our, our 9 o'clock time. So that's, that's our show for this evening. In conclusion, I'd like to uh, thank Emil, uh, Mike and Paul for joining us this evening here. Uh, thanks, guys, for, for all your uh, your uh, contributions here tonight. Mike, I know that you're washed out in, in our St. John's skies here tonight, but hopefully we'll be we'll be back to a clear sky again very soon. Uh, and of course, uh, you as well. Thank you for all joining on for uh, uh, in our um, in our presentation here tonight. We hope you enjoyed uh, what we could offer you here tonight from our cloudy skies in St. John, New Brunswick, and from our, our fairly clear skies in Hampton, and our mostly uh, clear skies here in Moncton, New Brunswick. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please click uh, below the video and uh, make sure you, that you click like. And please consider uh, subscribing to the channel for, uh, for future episodes. Also, please uh, 
Make sure that you comment. Let us know how what you thought about the video. Uh, if you thought that there were some things that we can improve, we're more than open to uh, suggestions here. Uh, it is a, a new experience for all of us here to offer this, but we're very pleased to be able to offer you some live sky views of the night sky. And so until next week, uh, we hope you have a great week, and we wish you all very clear skies. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining on.